Call council meeting order, uh, January 19, 2016. Uh, Tom Harris, give the blessing, please. Please bow with me, Lord. Thank you for these guys and gals that give their time to do what's best for the city of St. John. Continue to give them your wisdom. Help them to call on you for wisdom. Be with these, all of these in this meeting tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, is there any additions to the agenda? I don't see any. Citizens' comments, we got Janet Rose from Canquill, Grant Unruh, Unruh Brothers Waste Collection, Consent Agenda. We'll go with Jeanette Rose from Canquill. Yes. Uh, Janelle. Oh, wait a minute. Rose. Are, That's okay. Hold on a second. No, you're you got fine. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. You just called her Jeanette. That's You're welcome. Thank you so much for letting me come to talk to you tonight. And the reason I'm here to talk with you uh, is about tobacco-free policies for parks. And I work with CanQuick because that is the Kansas Tobacco Quit Line. But my major job is that I work with chronic disease risk reduction with Stafford County Health Department, Barton County Health Department, and Rice County Health Department. So I do work with tobacco-free policies in those three counties. And I came last year in January, I think, this, about this time, and talked with you and introduced the idea to you that tobacco-free policies for your parks areas, for your outdoor areas that your youth and children use would be a good thing and, and <clears throat> talk with you about some of the reasons why these tobacco free policies are good and I came tonight again to talk with you about this and to let you know that support in your community is building and that there are people in your community who are very much in favor of tobacco free policies at parks and outdoor areas and um, wanted to give you as much information about that as I could to let you know what all of your options are. There are a lot of groups throughout Kansas and throughout the United States that support tobacco-free policies. Of course, all of us in public health because we know that tobacco is still the number one cause of preventable death in the United States, in Kansas, in Barton County, Stafford County, and Rice County because it causes heart disease, because it causes cancer. Those are major causes of death and tobacco use is still the underlying reason. Um, all of the youth groups and sports groups, of course, also support tobacco-free policies in areas that youth use, and that's the National Alliance for Youth Sports, National Youth Sports Safety Foundation, and parents, of course, everywhere support tobacco-free policies. The National Youth Sports Coaches Association Code of Ethics states that each coach should provide a sports and environment that is free of tobacco, drugs, and alcohol too. Little League supports tobacco-free sports. Kansas High School Athletics Association also supports tobacco-free sports in our communities in Kansas and in all of our schools in Kansas. From the public health perspective, we know that having tobacco-free sports influences youth towards a positive lifestyle. It takes a united front from all of us involved. That means the cities need to work with the Recreation Commission, needs to work with the schools, needs to work with our county health departments so that we can protect as many people as possible. Our goal is to unite all those community groups and demonstrate to our youngsters that tobacco use is not part of a healthy lifestyle. Are tobacco-free policies effective? You might wonder why we go to the bother. The reason is, yes, tobacco-free policies are effective. They reinforce to the community the message that tobacco use is unhealthy and it's unnecessary behavior. It also, the policies ensure that participants and spectators are not exposed to secondhand smoke. That is really key. Policies help to create an atmosphere where leaders can model and promote positive, healthy lifestyle. Um, why would they be important at the outdoor facilities? Well, first of all, I have to tell you that we have statistics and tests that show that um, tobacco 
and exposure or secondhand smoke can be as at high a level in the outdoor areas as it is in indoor areas. And that really was demonstrated to me personally <laughs> because I went to Missouri to visit with my sister and went to an outdoor, just a, um, an outdoor fall show. It's the Apple Butter Festival in a little town just outside of St. Louis. And there were a lot of people smoking that day in the outdoor show. And I really had a tough time breathing. I had a bit of a cold, but boy, that really made a difference to me. So I know that it can be, um, it can be an exposure at a level that is detrimental to people's health, even in an outdoor area. Just when you think it might not be, but it can be. A, a city policy would also create a consistency at youth recreation leagues, like at the rec department, as well as at any contests that are held on your properties that are school oriented and school sponsored, like the high school uh, fields and everything. That also would be a consistent policy then because the schools already have a tobacco free policy. But you are the body that also has decision making powers over the fields that the city owns. You'll always have decision making ability on any of the properties, of course, that you use. Um, the policies also for any of the city owned fields and facilities would help to support any local group that uses those particular areas and helps to reinforce that healthy lifestyle to any of the other local groups beyond the schools and the recreation commissions that use those areas. And another key thing that I think you should know is that discarded cigarette butts cause litter. They require maintenance expenses and they can be ingested by toddlers. And that was one of the key things that we have found. The, uh, particularly now with the e-cigarettes, the number of calls to the poison control centers have just skyrocketed in the last two to three years because little kids stick things in their mouths. That's how they learn about stuff. We all know that. And they pick up those things, the, e the discarded cartridges, and they will put those in their mouth. And at that level, for a little bitty person, that can be pretty toxic pretty quickly. And so the calls to the poison control centers have gone up dramatically because of the e-cigarette cartridges that are being discarded. I also saw something really interesting today that um, it costs about 22 cents per cigarette package that is smoked for litter removal costs. For every cigarette package or every pack of cigarettes that is smoked, it costs 22 cents in litter removal and maintenance. And that's indoor and outdoor costs. So that's something to keep in mind too. There is a real cost to the city for policy or for having tobacco use in your parks and in your recreation areas. Um, those are some of the reasons why they're important. In your packets, I know that LaDonna probably provided to you some information about a model policy. I wanted you to have an example of a model policy. Of course, model policies are made to be changed, to be adapted and adopted for each local use. So those are the kinds of things that you can change. You can, um, I think I sent it in a, a Word doc, and, and it's easily changed to read however you want. So I wanted you to know what those policies look like. Most of the time, they're going to outline some kind of specific outdoor recreational facility that's covered, whether that be a playground or a park or a beach. We don't have a beach to worry about here, but it does usually tell you exactly what it covers, so it's really important to have that kind of phraseology, that, those phrases in there. Policies describe how the users are going to find out about the new policy, how we're going to let everybody know, and that's an, another important part, whether that goes into policy handbooks or if it goes into mailing or it's just simply an announcement that goes in the paper those kinds of ways of announcing it. And it also talks about how enforcement will occur. And you probably are very concerned, and I know that I've had questions from the police department before about, you know, we really don't want to go out there and write tickets for giving for somebody who is smoking a cigarette or using tobacco in a park. And I agree, none of us wants to be the tobacco police. So 
really the very easiest and simplest things about policies for parks and recreation areas, you simply put the sign up. And then if someone notices that someone is using tobacco around their children, they're free to walk over and say, hey, we have a tobacco-free policy for our park. Can you please, you know, put the cigarette out or stop using that right here? And if it's blatant, maybe even somebody in the community, if they're really using tobacco very close to small children especially, somebody in the community could say, hey, you really need to walk off the property if you want to use tobacco right now rather than do that right by our children. Um, I was really surprised that even in the health department, this happened last year, we had someone walk in and use an e-cigarette in our lobby right among our moms with tiny babies. That's what our appointments were that morning, was moms with tiny babies. And they sat there and puffed away until we got there and asked them to make sure that they used that outside and away from our doors. Um, so there are some people you really have to educate that this is a danger. These cigarettes are still a danger. The propellants and everything in them, we don't even really know what's all in these cigarettes. But we know that those are still a danger for anyone who has lungs that are compromised or um, brand new in any way. So we, we do want to protect our children especially. Um, so the signs are really the best way to enforce policies. Uh, you can also put it in your policy manuals. You can put it in newsletters that go out to parents. Um, if, there were, if you adopted something like that and the Recreation Commission wanted to, they could put that in a newsletter. Just a simple announcement that, hey, this park is tobacco free and that's, that's what we are uh, working towards. And just let everybody know in that way. You can also get some, um, you can have your coaches and your teams kind of sign off and say, yes, we're now aware that this is a tobacco free policy. And parents can too, uh, for that matter. Um, it all depends on what you want to write as your policy, how you want that to be written, how you want to state things. There are lots of resources available to help write those policies, to help you write the policy. And of course, I am a resource for you. I would come and sit down with you, discuss policy, help you get it to where you want it to be, and make sure that it says what you want it to say. That is part of my work, is to help you determine what is best for your community and what you would like for a policy to say. Let's see, is there anything else? You might ask, what's the difference between a policy and an ordinance? A policy usually is just a basic rule that you established for some of your property and it's, a lot of times it's just approved by your city council or by your county board if, it, you had, if this was a county policy. And you do not give out fines usually if it's a policy infraction. Uh, you might ask them to stop using tobacco and ask them to leave the premises. That might be the extent of the enforcement and putting up the signs. The ordinances then are usually are, uh, more of a regulation that is enacted and a lot of times ordinances come with fines and come with penalties. If they have, uh, if they break the law or break the ordinance then you have fines and penalties that go along with that. But that is not really what I would recommend for most of the cities in the area that I serve. I think policies are just a really good thing and a good way to accomplish what you want to accomplish in this case without going to the extent of an ordinance. And of course, your local government always has the power to enact and to, um, to set the rules for any of your own properties. You know, some people say, well, we can't go against what the state has said that we need to do. And um, you cannot go against what the state has to do or has said is the law or is the regulation but you can enact something stronger than what the state has enacted. And at this point, the state has enacted nothing about outdoor areas and playgrounds and parks. So you are free to do anything that you want. And always local rule, and I'm sure your lawyer would tell you that too, always local rule is the most important of the rules that are being made. 
you have the power to do that. Um, most park directors are really in favor of tobacco-free parks. For one thing, it makes it their lives easier. They have less maintenance, it's cleaner, they spend less time uh, taking care of their park areas, and the violations and enforcement are really not an issue. It's pretty much self-enforced. And that's probably the beauty of having a policy. You don't have to worry about it. You put the signs up, and most people follow just a simple rule like that. Did you have any questions you wanted to ask me? Is there anything I can help you with at this point? It's pretty much self-explanatory. OK. Um, could I ask Nick <clears throat> to also say something? Would that be acceptable at this point? Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, he's, 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 he's with it. Okay. Go ahead, um, <clears throat> Just uh, with being involved with, with the facility that we have, using Brown Park and Cornwall Park, 98% um, of issues that occur down there I can handle. The other 2% I call dispatch. And I've had is issues at, um, at the baseball diamond where there would be some consumption of alcohol. I'd either tell them pour it out or leave, and it's usually take care of itself. Um, we do have people that smoke on the south side of the, the Brown Park, <clears throat> and when there's kids playing baseball, I mean, that south wind, I mean, even when kids would say, oh, somebody's smoking, I mean, they can smell it. And then also at Cornwall Park. <clears throat> but uh, usually everybody's really good about that stuff. So, I mean, it's not a, a major issue if I tell them, you know, Maybe we not shouldn't do that right now. Just wait an hour or something like that. We've had great luck, so um, you know I, I'd I'd be in favor of, of uh, I definitely support maybe some signage and that type of thing. And plus, I'm I'm usually at most all the events anyway, and pretty well can can handle those things. And and it goes very well. I, I hardly have any any issues. So anyway, <clears throat> I, I would be in support of uh, uh, city council. Would entertain the thought of looking for a policy and you know possibly signage that type of thing. What areas are you guys looking at? All I, of them? I'd uh, say Cornwell and uh, Brown or the baseball diamond. I mean as far as I'm concerned that uh, as far as the rep commission when we use the uh, the facilities. Um, Corn Cornwell Park of course is a big one in the spring and fall when we have soccer because it's it's kind of a mad Madhouse when we have uh, games there, and especially with the new addition of the wonderful playground equipment, uh, there are quite a few kids there using that part of the park. But um, those two areas that it would be my main uh, concern right there. But and I'd also like you to know that you would not be the first group in this whole area to have a tobacco-free park. Um, Rick and Rec has also adopted a policy for their new playground and new um, playground area, especially for small children in that area, too. Do we want to look over this and put it on old business and maybe discuss it next meeting? And yeah, why don't we do that? It's a chance to reread re everything. And if you would need any more information, please just ask LaDonna to email me. I'd be very happy to supply you with anything you need. And actually, I don't know if, if, uh, if you would adopt a policy and would need some signage. I don't know where you order your signs. Does your city department or your county department have a sign making shop or something like that? No, we don't make them. We have to order. We, okay, I might be able to help you with that too. As, as part of the help that I can assist you with. So um, and, and the I'd be glad would to. Pay for too. I mean, or is it, I mean, it would be no cost city. Um, if, if, uh, yeah. Between the if, two of us, yes, I think. Yes, we'll get it covered. There will okay. be there will be no expense to the city at all. The rec commission will, will pay for those signs. Okay. Any other questions for Janelle? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, you very much. I really appreciate thank the opportunity to come. And thank you. Grant Andrew, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Trey.
Everybody got a copy of the solid waste contract with the changes. Oh. Well, that's okay. Uh, consent agenda. Approving minutes of regular meeting 105 2016. Approve appropriation ordinance 1231 2015. The amount $16,433.84. Approve appropriation ordinance 0119. 2016, the amount of $44,897.78. I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Any more discussion? All in favor? All opposed? 4-0, 4 one 4 uh, oh, Let's back up and catch this Stafford County trash. Uh, contract. There's been some uh, changes in it. Unruh Brothers was supposed to be here to discuss this, but uh, I, LaDonna said that they looked at it and they didn't see anything wrong with it. The stuff in the red was LaDonna's changes. The stuff in the blue was Corey's additions, and the stuff in the yellow was John, our attorney's uh, input on it. Did <coughs> anybody have a chance to look this over? It's not a contract. It's, it's this is a new ordinance. New ordinance, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, 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 excuse my... The council will recall there were at some point, and I think that last stuff was updated in like 84, um, there was an individual at the county level that were, was required to approve um, some solid waste stuff. So this basically decouples the... Since that position doesn't exist at the county level, it decouples your solid waste ordinance from <coughs> county rules or regulations or, or whatever the county had that the cities are required to file. It's it's fairly straightforward. It's it's the stuff adopted and recommended by the Kansas League of Municipalities along with some additions that make them more um, not favorable but more of the local flavor. I guess more more tuned into into what's going on at St. John. I, I had LaDonna send it to Unruh's. I thought it would be unfair if we signed, if they signed a, a salt waste contract and then we promptly changed the law on them. So uh, not not so that they could give a, a yes or no vote, but simply so they uh, could review it to make sure that they aren't going to have any huge problems with anything. And you did say Grant said, Grant said it, was it was looked okay to them. Mm -hmm. You said it was fine. What? I've got one question on this billing side of it. Mm -hmm. Actually, you have to explain it to me because I guess I don't understand it. I mean, is it is this stating that everybody pays for it? Correct. Unless you guys say otherwise. Because it says except for instructed. Well, it says except instructed differently in the Solid Waste City Contract Agreement because we don't do the commercial billing. Right. So if the contract says that they're going to do the commercial billing, then that gives that says that we don't have to do that anymore. And then it says the termination of the bill for longer than 90 days will require the city approval prior to the bill being generated. Otherwise, these charges is implemented regardless of service being provided. So it pretty much means that like the 90 days is like your snowbirds, the snowbirds that, that travel. So are you saying everybody will pay it whether they use the service or not? Correct. And that is even if they have their own commercial dumpster somewhere, they're taking their trash to, correct? Correct. Unless they come to council and council instructs, you know, they can come and they can talk to you and you guys can decide, well, we're only going to charge this person that has five dumpsters, we're only going to charge them one. But that would be your guys' decision to make. Because I know there's a lot of people in town that own multiple places. They have one dumpster at one place, which they're still getting their trash picked up. But they take all their trash from them other places and put it in that one dumpster. So we're charging them for something that they're not getting picked up at four other places. Which, and that's just a policy decision that, that, that yeah. you, I mean, I'm, yeah, or there's no advocation for any way. That's just a policy decision you guys can make. If, if you want to go that route, then I, I probably would want <coughs> an amendment of that draft. I guess it wouldn't be ready for adoption today, or it could be yeah. it could be ready for adoption with that change. 
the other side of that is that regarding the billing, the Unruh brothers had some businesses that needed more than once a week pickup, as did the previous provider, and um, it would become kind of a, an administrative nightmare, I guess, for, for city staff to keep track of which businesses need to pick up and, and how many times and whether there needs to be additional pickup on any given week. So that just lets them handle it. Um, that, and really it cuts out the middleman. But, but I'm, I'm saying, like, I mean, they bill all the commercial anyway, under his due. Right. Right, nothing else. But, else. like, Bob has a house and a shop and a shop uptown, and he has he gets charged for trash at three places, but he only uses it at a shop, which he pays under his directly. Right, if, and if that's, the, if that's the way the council wants to go, or is, is if, if you're going to use it at your home, you know, only when you're using it at your home, you pay for it, then, then we, that can, it can be done. You know, and I know there's another guy in town that owns three or four places here in town, but I mean, if we're charging by the meter, I guess is what I'm saying. Right. If you get a utility bill and you're paying for it and you're not having the service, it's not really right, as long as you are getting rid of your trash, though. All right. But the, the nightmare that occurs is, is I just don't think it's our office that gets to decide that. I mean, I'd rather have it that be a policy that says that this is what we're going to do then, like Pam, Vicky, and I deciding, okay, well, Bobby doesn't have to be charged. Right, right. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, it should be the person that owns in four places that says, okay, my dumpster sits at this location and I'm playing unruse, but I'm taking my trash from this address, right. this address, and this address, and it all goes in this dumpster. Right. It, I, and all we're asking them to yeah, do is to... Saying. Yeah, I'm yeah. not saying you guys do the work on it. If they don't come right. forward and say, hey, you know, this is, I've got three places and this I'm... This is where you're at. Will you approve us to only pick right. up right. location? So yeah, so be right. that's, yeah, that's all we're saying is that we just want them to come to you guys and, and I mean, it, say it, that. It, it probably, where it says termination of bill for longer than 90 days, if you take out that entire sentence, I think it still needs to say, except when instructed differently with Salt Lake's contractor's agreement, which gives you the opportunity then to um, allow by contract under to bill for the commercial rate, okay, which is by the way. I mean, mean, is that language essential? No, but if we're going to strike the requirement that everybody pays and we it's starting at termination, uh, if we eliminate all that, the rest of that stuff in red, then that would do it. And we can adopt the ordinance eliminating that paragraph and then or that right. sentence and then we can um, make that change before it's approved. I mean, I just, I think it's wrong to bill somebody for something that they don't use at four places, but they're still using the service. I mean, that's... Oh, what, I agree. I'm not, I don't have... I mean, that's my only thing. Right. Like, you know, I mean, the only time I'm that, not saying letting somebody just say, well, I don't want the service, so I ain't use it, I ain't paying for it. Right. That ain't right. right. If, if you don't have a place to go with your trash, then you can't do it. But, right. The, the only time it becomes an issue, and it's not an issue in St. John, is sometimes you have smaller communities, and in order to get a contractor to come out to your community, you have to guarantee a certain number of households or a certain number of money. That is not the case here. I don't think that would ever be the case, and certainly if it does become the case at some point in the future, this ordinance can be just as easy as it is. That was my only so, real question on so the whole thing. So take that line out. But then the the residents that don't have a commercial, that they don't want to use the surface whatsoever. How how do you handle those? Like well, I you like yeah. Well, yeah. well yeah. it doesn't it doesn't say that. It doesn't say yes. <coughs> it doesn't say no. And it doesn't say on the utility contract either. The, the, but but the ordinance also prohibits them from burying their trash or burning their trash, and it prohibits them from <coughs> hiring somebody other than the individual or company that you're contracted with. What they could do is they could haul their own trash every single week out to um, right. Reno County and deposit the trash there on their own. Right. And they could do that, and anybody can do that. And you have to have it in there because how many times are people taking their own debris? You know, excess debris out to the dump on the on their own. But um, 
the, the other issue to that is, is the city just has to remain vigilant if somebody allows trash to grow on their property because they're not taking trash out but once a month and they, they need to be prosecuted through the municipal court. And that's going to be more expensive than the $16 they would have spent on trash. But do we have to have that in there? It's if, in there. If I mean, what I'm saying is if I take my trash to Reno County, do I have the right to refuse paying it to the city? Yes. You have the right to turn off your trash. But I think, like when, I think it says work. in here that it has to be hauled to a facility. To right. right. They couldn't and take so it to the edge of town and dump it. They'd have to take it to right. Reno County or some other place. Barton right. County. One and I was two. just I was trying to put that in there because in the past, the policy <clears> in the <throat> office was that, no, they had to pay for it. No matter, matter what, they had to pay for the service. But we couldn't find it anywhere written anywhere. But call, the business practice here was that if you had a meter, you got charged. And it's been kind of fluid, you know, like like Marshall said, it, people that had a container somewhere else were using that other container. And, and you're right, you kind of put staff in the awful position of having to decide. And I think you just decide that if we're going to allow some people not to contract for or, or to have that utility, then we have to give that option to everybody. So well, that, that's, that's what happens. I mean, yeah, and I'm not, you know, it, it's just one of the things, and that's one of the biggest complaints I've heard about it is one guy gets, takes all his to a dumpster and pays the same person that picks up all the other trash to dump it, but he's getting charged at, at five places. Right. Where he's only actually getting service at one. I mean, he's still following the rules by getting right. rid of his trash, but he's, you know, paying for it more than... And you, and you could try this. I mean, if you have mass number of people calling to terminate their their trash utility, then council may want to. I mean, I think it, it at some point. I, I don't think it really benefits anybody other than save them some money, and it's typically probably the commercial business owners or a farmer that lives in town that has two or three places, or you know, those type of people that are got a dumpster sitting at their business, they just take their household trash and put it in there. Yep. So I think that needs to be in there and if it gets out of hand I guess we can always change it. We need to, I think we need to, <clears throat> to leave it in where you're mandatory to have trash service provided you don't have a commercial dumpster. You know, I, I think that opens up a can of worms because I know we're going to have to verify they have a commercial dumpster. And what if somebody has a commercial dumpster outside of city limits? I can see stuff getting. I can, I can see some problems. Well, yeah, I mean, you would have to. I would make it to where you have to have some form of. Trash pickup. Yeah. Trash pickup. Or show proof that you're removing of it of yourself. I mean, whether that's a receipt from when you take it to Reno County or Barton County Landfill, because they're going to charge you for it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, we would have proof because we've got somebody that goes around and, and writes these kind of things up if people are, are accumulating trash. Right. I mean, we know everybody that has a commercial dumpster in this town. We've got a list of them. I, 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 I just, for purposes of this type of ordinance and, and the need to for ordinances to be simple so they can be followed, I, I don't think you can exempt, let's just say it's not wise to exempt certain people, not, not others. I think that exemption is applied across the board. Otherwise, you're going to, not that it would be challenged in any means because that would be bizarre, but um, it, it would be more difficult to police something like that than, than I think. You, you, I mean, I, the council could always go one direction in reverse course. I, you're essentially saying that's, that, that, that. I mean, for instance, Bob's commercial dumpster is not owned by Bob. It's owned by Bob's company, whether that be a DBA or LLC. So, because Bob has organized his company, 
and that company is contracting for trash service, does Bob get to use that company? It's trash service. And if Bob's using it, do, if he's got employees, are they allowed to use it? So does Bob have to call the city and say, I've given my employee to permission to use my, my trash dumpster and therefore they shouldn't be paying for it? Or what if he only owns half the company? So does he have to own more than 50% of the, the company that has the commercial account? I mean, it's just... It, it opens up. The only thing that I was... Oh. I think we should go back to my sentence. The only thing I was talking about, Marshall, is we have a... I know of, of uh, items now that's being put in commercial dumpsters. They're but, not paying tax for the support. Right. Well, I can also tell you all my stuff from my house goes in my commercial dumpster. Mine does too. Because they're right beside each other. And I've paid for trash service for, I don't know, five years that way. The, the other thing is, I, I think how it's written minus that sentence leaves it how the policy has been from the beginning. Um, and I, if, if, if I think you just need to, to remove that sentence and and adopt it that way, and then if it becomes a problem, then the city can revisit. My, my concern is you're going to have individuals who are going to have some kind of side agreement with your former uh, trash provider. And there have been people who have called to cancel their trash service and have said that we are going with the former trash provider, which is against city ordinance. That was my concern. I don't know, for, for five years, it don't matter to me. I just know that there's other people who have brought it to my attention. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, if we want to leave it how it is and see how many complaints we get about everybody getting billed every month, then... And, and this isn't in a hurry. I mean, if, if you want to wait no. until we've got full council and mayor, then they can be adopted next time around. You've been mm -hmm. not really compliant with the county rules since for at least 16 some years or something. <laughs> Should we put that on old business? Yeah, I'd say you put want it on with the, You want me to go ahead and strike the line, or do you just want to talk about that line with everybody? Is the rest of the, the ordinance, is it all okay? I think the rest of it looks yeah. fine. I just... I mean, I'm, I'm the type of person that I don't believe in billing somebody for something that they right. don't get. Well, and, and I agree with that, too. I just think that they need to come to council and say, hey, this is my reason why, and then it's written down, and then it's there for the office, so then we can say this is why this person isn't doing it. They came to council, and council approved it as not to have to charge them for it. Otherwise, you get charged. I mean, the only the only problem with that process is is, is you're, you're you're essentially setting up a due process requirement for people to prove that that they should be allowed out of their trash service. So what if somebody comes to you and says, "I just can't afford it"? I take it put in my neighbor's dumpster. Yeah, that's where I was going with that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I understand that somebody comes in and, and says, well, can't call it. That section will be 15 people long when you're not And then we're going around town throwing it in everybody else's dumpsters who's paying for it. But you have the one behind the city office gets filled up. Yeah, it is. I'm sure it is. I put it on old business and we'll discuss yeah. the next meeting. Okay. Okay, are we done with that? Yes. Okay. Uh, I assume everybody's got a letter in front of them or has had a chance to see this and read it. You'll be safe. Yes, minutes. I would. I'd like to talk with Colonel John here for a little bit. Just, just real. I mean, all, all cities receive these anonymous letters, and, and, and we've kind of told people, and, and you guys can, can handle it how you want, that it's kind of hard to address an anonymous letter. So, um, our policy has always been to instruct cities to just ignore anonymous letters. That being said, it's really two letters. If you guys want to talk about the first one in public session, that's fine. If you want to get down and talk about individual um, employees, then, then that would need to be in uh, executive session. I've got, uh, I've got one question. Adam, have, have you discussed this letter with your the rest of your staff? Mm -hmm. They're all aware of it? They're all aware of it. They've all got copies of it. Any problems there? 
As far as I'm concerned. I'm, I'm going to say as far as I'm concerned, throw it away. As far as I'm concerned, it's an anonymous letter. It means nothing to me. That's how I feel about it. They want to put their name to it. Maybe we'll read it and discuss it. But other than that, I don't feel that we need to. Yeah, I think that if the... In order to have any type of validity to this, you know, you put your name to it. You know, if they said, that they, I think it was stated in here that if they didn't, they would put it in the paper. Well, power to that would be that would be fine. I don't have a problem with that. Um, Council Member Williamson, I feel the same way. It's nothing. Okay, Council. Adam, you got anything you want to talk about? I do. Uh, absent the mayor, I don't believe so. I, I had a, uh, a meeting with her and Mark, um, referenced some departmental issues. Um, and after that meeting, I had a meeting with all my staff last night. Um, and it went very well. Um, some things that need to be addressed and taken care of were actually the majority of it was, was had already been handled. Um, so I, I don't know if. if She's going to want to discuss anything when she comes back, and I'd be more than happy to, to take that up then. But I mean, like I said, I just, there's there's all kinds of talking rumors going around town, and, and that's all been discussed and, and taken care of. So, council got anything for uh, Chief Adam? Nope. Chief okay. Thank you. Anything else? Nope. Okay. We'll move on to clerk's report. Okay. So in your guys' packet, you guys should have had a utility write-off list. Now, um, let me, this, this list is of terminated accounts, which the people have, have either moved away or they have set up something else. Um, it has been set to the set-off program, but the ones marked in yellow, we have not received a payment from the set-off program for some time. So what we're asking is if we can write them off the CIC program and kind of keep track of them manually so then that way they're not constantly showing up on our reports. Um, if we do happen to receive money from the set-off program for one of these people, we still receive it in and keep it. It just would not get credited, like receded in to them. It gets receded into a pool kind of line item instead of to that individual. I think that the total, if you add it all up, it's probably sixteen thousand dollars around for there all for all the ones, the ones in yellow, yellow. just wow. the ones in yellow. Right. And they'll still be at the set-off program. We just want to take them off the list because we haven't received payment for them for a while. But there's one person on there that's on there four times. How did that happen? <laughs> um, I don't know. I asked that too. <laughs> A lot of this stuff is. A lot of it, it's it's prior to me. I didn't understand how could that happen. And and as you could see, you guys will probably recognize some names as people still living here, which probably what has happened is that the utilities is set up in someone else's name for them, but there's nothing we can do about that. If any one of these people would happen to move back or want to put utilities up in their name. They have to pay that amount first before we would set up utilities for them. Sherry, on some of them that are multiple, it's a possibility that there's multiple meters at that mm -hmm. one address. So that each one of those meters meet. could be read That's individually. What it looks That's like what it looks like. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Knowing that person, I think they owned a restaurant here prior to somebody else. No, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the set off program is just the. Uh, is that through the Kansas State? If they, so file, if taxes. they file taxes. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to get that whole lump sum of taxes for that person because that person could have multiple companies assigned to them from the set off. But it does mean that if they file, we should get a portion of their return. Any garnish wages on any of this stuff? Well, I think Troy had that same question, mm -hmm. and, and, and Donna and I talked about it briefly. You know, Candidly, I don't know. I don't see why it couldn't. You just have to get a judgment against them. Um, and, and I don't know. Did you check? Did anybody? I, I checked, but no one's responded yet. We were curious it. as to whether any cities had found that 
economical. So you're saying these ones in yellow, you're just wanting to take them off of your computer program, Correct. but they'll stay on the set off program. Correct. And 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 you're Pam, just not going to track them. We just want. Correct. And it'll just go into one. It'll go pool. into one pool. If we would get money from them, then we would receipt it in, but it wouldn't be an individual receipt. It would mm -hmm. go into a, just a, a group line item, a group pool. Well, I say if it makes life easier for you guys, just go ahead and yeah, take it off. Say go ahead. And, yeah. Is there some way that you can make it, just drop them into another section where you keep this? Are you going to keep it on a spreadsheet? Pam, Pam keeps it, on a spreadsheet. it, yeah, we keep it on a spreadsheet. So then that way we know when we receive money from them. So I mean, they we'll won't, still have we don't want to, for correct. something you, that comes in. Correct. It, it just won't be on this. It just won't be on the CIC system, right. okay. pretty much. Okay. But we still keep track of it manually. Like That's if it was me. Um, and let's say I, I did it, and then I got sent to the set off, and you guys wrote me wrote me off. Pam has a separate sheet. She actually, This is actually her spreadsheet. And she would go in there, and she would update that today we got money from the set off program for LaDonna. But when she receipts it into CIC, it wouldn't go underneath my account. It would go into the group pool account. She would just receive it right into the group pool. And you need to make that on a... On a spreadsheet, or the accountants when they audit it, they're going to yep. wonder where that went. Yeah. Just where I'm yep. going with that. Yep. Oh, and yeah. she knows, and right. she she tracks it. But I don't have a problem with taking that. So, do they we have need to move? I think they have to. Yeah. John, do we have to make a motion on that? To write them off, or can we're not writing them off. Well, well not to remove you're, them you're from removing the them from the system. Right. I, I, yeah, let me just go ahead. I don't think I heard say anything. Let's make that motion then. Okay. Second. We've got a motion and a second on the table to uh, move these off of the accounting end to another spreadsheet. Uh, make it easier on the donor. All in favor? All against? 21. Uh, on another way of looking at that, you know, there, there are ways, companies that do this type of debt collection. Okay. And and um, if you talk to Christy at Screen Search, you can give you the name of the company. They, use, use, okay. they, they keep a third, but you know, it, it's somebody out there attempting to, to collect this stuff. And okay. You know, you know, it, a third is more than what we've got paid right. on any of them for 10 years anyway, so right. I mean, it would almost be something to look into. Yeah. While we're talking about that, guys, I think you ought to look at. Uh, uh, Account number 1334 Yeah. I've, I've been watching, I've been looking at this for eight years. It's been on there that long? Yes, it has. 07. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, the, that one just recently got added to the set off program. And that's because we just recently got his identification number. You either so have to have the social number or you have to have the driver's license to link them up. Now, in the past, they don't ask for that when you set up utilities. Now, the policy is that you do. You have to get the copy of the driver's license. You have to get the social security number for this very purpose. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. we Sometimes, did, these people owe child, back child support and it comes out of their... Their tax refund before anything like this does. Yeah. Maybe 18 years of it. Yeah. Right. So maybe some of these, or that one. Maybe particular. that one. We'll right. have to look and see. But hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping that this year maybe you will see that. Okay. See something. Okay. Anything else on that? No, on, on that. Now, um, we already talked about the solid waste. So now um, I need someone to make a motion to go into executive session to talk about non personnel. How long? About 15 minutes. Let's make a motion for a 15 minute executive session to discuss non elected personnel. I can include me and I can include Corey and the attorney. To include counsel, city clerk, superintendent. City Attorney. The reason being to discuss oh, the review. Yes. To discuss. Review. Review. Two review of two individuals. Mm -hmm. To resume. And, and discuss possible, possible wage increase for those individuals. To resume okay. at 805. Okay. Second that. Got a motion or a second? All in favor? 
close order one. Bring back to order. We're going to move the uh, uh, executive session to old business. That we just went into executive session for. Corey. Okay, so I have on here um, last week, if we remember right, uh, it was brought up about the old Methodist church here to the north. Um, I, I just walked the uh, perimeter and just and did an exterior evaluation. You can kind of see what I what I came up with here. That's just if you were walking around it and and seeing what you've got. Um, there are several broken windows. Lots of windows are completely missing. Um, there is unsecure access both front and rear of the property. Um, to me, that does pose an issue um, with the building being open. As well, there when, when I walked up there, there was animals leaving the building too. So, uh, yeah. So I just kind of put together a little piece here. Oh, Joan, if you wanted to add the, uh, on or the, the, the process here is that um, the, the city adopts a resolution. Um, but in order for me to prepare that resolution, uh, I, I really need, and this isn't a slight on, on Corey, but it's just I need somebody with some kind of like structural, structural background, background that can go in and tell me about the condition of that property. See, and I, did, I didn't enter the property. I just went around the exterior from, from what I could see from the exterior just to, like I say, give a preliminary and then just get it get it started, go in the direction you need to go with it. When Donna says she found somebody in Hutchinson and, and she can get before the next meeting an idea on what something like that would cost, again, the expenses for this process, the process gets tacked on to the property, okay? Um, once a resolution is adopted, that resolution provides a certain period of time in which the owner of that property has to make repairs. Yeah, that's kind of why we need that report. He needs to know. First of all, we need to know whether there's, it's structurally unsafe. Okay, obviously it's unsafe if, if somebody can get into it. Um, and, and then um, um, if he doesn't do it, doesn't make repairs, and then the, then the council can decide at that point whether to go in and, and do it themselves. And again, that cost gets gets taxed on to to the property. I will will tell the council that today. Um, a gentleman with a, from a Colorado phone number uh, who apparently has a house in Hudson read the article in the paper and called and said to let me know if I've had contact with the property owner that he wants to buy that thing and turn it into a residence for him and his family. Um, so right now it is just sitting uselessly exposed to the elements which is a beautiful building. I don't know short of us dragging this guy back to St. John, what's going to get him motivated to take care of that thing? I mean, he's been a problem since I started here. He does have other properties here in town. And I'm a, I don't even know what condition those are in, but in, in, you know, if you're going to have somebody come in town to, uh, to look at that property, let's let them look at all these other properties that are dilapidated and, 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 and get the ball rolling on, on something like that. Can we legally go in and secure the doors on it? You can. Okay, there's a provision if it's an immediate hazard, okay, and plywood or whatever can be done. You know, to me it's an immediate hazard because kids can get into it. Right. You know, maybe you can, if only the top windows, and you can look at that, that picture in the paper, you can see the windows mm -hmm. missing. If it was just the top windows, I'd say no. But, but if people can go in and go out of it, you know, certainly if cats or whatever was getting into it can get into it, and, and small children or, you know, mischievous children can get into it. I would, I would think we ought to let the Donna, the Donna get some prices to see what a yeah, engineer what it's or cost. whatever we need. But I think we also need to get it secured. Yeah. Get the door secured on the building. Yeah, but can we legally do that right now? The, the governing body would just need to make that decision. And you guys are the governing body. It's not really a decision for for, for Corey to make on his own, but he can be instructed if he's, yeah. if he's comfortable. I mean, I. I mean, you just screw it in plywood. I, I would think to the frame. I, I, I would recommend to do the doors and and the lower and the second level. Um, the second level, there's a lot of windows missing off of that staircase, and you can get into there. 
the the third story. I don't feel like that we need to. I mean, to go up whatever a kid could get into. Story. I would just assume the city spend a little money and secure it. If they're okay, going to get that, into it, they're going to get into it. Uh, it. We need to secure it. Is that something you're wanting to direct Corey to do, or is that something you want to hire somebody to do? Or? Can you take care of it? Yeah, I believe we can take care of it. Well, let's just yeah. go ahead and have you take care of it then. Okay. Probably need a motion. Then. Make that motion then. Second. Put a motion and a second on the table for Corey. So the motion is that um, that the open doors constitute an immediate hazard requiring immediate attention, and you're you're directing him to um, secure the building to, to, to eliminate that immediate hazard. Okay, do I need to read that? No. <laughs> no, I, I got it. I think you got it. Okay. Motion's been made to secure the front door and the second story. And the council is going to direct the court or superintendent to do that. Then a motion and a second. All in favor? Motion passes 4-0. That takes care of that. Corey, the next thing we you need a motion for executive session to discuss security measures for the public building and facilities. So, so we'll move. Ten minutes. To include. to include security measures. No, who do Council. you want? Oh, oh. Council, the mayor's not here, the attorney, and clerk. Sorry. And when, when's the meeting going to come back in the session? It's about 20 hours. 22. Or 820. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. 820. Yeah. You made a motion and a second. Yeah. Got a motion and a second. All in favor? All opposed? Motion 96 cents. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? All opposed? 4 0. That's all I have. Thank you. Attorney report. Other than what we've talked about here, I don't have anything else to add. Nope. You got anything on old business? Nope. Anybody knows? Uh, nope. nope. New business. Nope. Nope. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. There's a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor. Motion.